denizens of the night. Welcome to another episode of the macabre, the terrifying. Broadcasting live from a rickety boat floating over a bottomless depth, I will be your guide through the witching hours. Tonight, we'll hear the story of a beautiful relationship between a grandfather and grandson set in an old house built near the shores of a majestic lake. Each year, the pair work on a project throughout the summer, strengthening their bond and affections for one another. They plan a large project, building a dock on the lake. But before they can even begin, tragedy strikes. This story is called The Lake Behind My Grandpa's House is Deeper Than It Should Be and was written by Flying Bear Fish. My grandfather passed away about eight months ago. It still feels a little surreal. I'd always been close to him. When I was little, I would visit him every year for summer break. My mom didn't have to find a daycare or sitter while school was out and I got to go swimming and fishing in the lake behind his house. Win-win. Each summer, he would have new activities planned. Sometimes we would try new fishing techniques. Other years, we would go hunting for deer in the rolling fields and wooded sections of his land. It was nearly 80 acres, which felt like an infinite amount of space to explore as a kid. One year, we spent nearly two whole months building a treehouse overlooking the lake. It would be the biggest project we had undertaken by far. It might even take a couple summers to get it done. I was so excited, my parents had to practically drag me back home. But the deck never got built. That winter, my grandpa started having some issues. He would call my mom in the middle of the night ranting and raving about things that didn't make any sense. Most of the time, she could get him to calm down. One time, it got so bad, she had to drive all the way out to his house, nearly two hours, in the middle of the night, and stay with him for a couple days. I could see it was tough on her. Unfortunately, he only got worse over time. His neighbors found him wandering around in the woods in his pajamas more than once, unable to find his way back home. By the next spring, it was clear he couldn't live on his own anymore. Against his protests, my mom moved him into an assisted care facility only a few minutes away from us. I went with her to visit a couple times every week. For a while, he was happy to see us. Then he was just confused. Eventually, he didn't respond much at all. Everything happened so fast. One day we were hanging out, fishing and listening to old Hank Williams songs. The next day he was nothing but a shell. He lived in that care facility for about five years. It was longer than the doctors had initially estimated. Near the end, I wasn't sure if that was a blessing or a curse. He passed just a few days before his 70th birthday. We had the funeral reception out at his house. My mom and I had to do some cleaning and repairs beforehand. After sitting mostly untouched for five years, it was still in pretty decent shape, all things considered. The ceremony and reception were both small, but nice. After the reception, I went out and stood by the lake by myself for a while. It was only maybe a couple hundred feet across, but it seemed so much bigger when I was just a kid. I got quite the surprise a couple days later. At the reading of my grandpa's will, we found out he had left the house and land to me. He had written it only a few months before my last summer with him. I could feel my aunt's barely veiled jealousy, but at least my mom was happy for me. 
She offered to fix up the few remaining things we hadn't gotten to before the reception. She even said she'd help me pay for movers if I decided to move in completely. I wasn't ready to do that just yet. I still needed to finish school, and I had a feeling there was probably more to be done around the lot than it seemed on the surface. But every weekend, I drove up and did a little bit more to get it ready. Clearing out dead trees, replacing the warped old siding on the house, pouring new gravel for the driveway. It was slow going, but I was getting closer every day. Then, one day a few months ago, while I was cleaning piles of junk out of the garage, I found some rough blueprints still spread out on my grandpa's old workbench. It was the plans for the lake dock, our grand project we never got to build. I'd be lying if I said I didn't get a little emotional looking them over. They were basically all done, missing a few measurements, but nothing too crazy. So I decided right then and there, I was going to build the deck. I would finish this one last summer project. I went and bought most of the lumber and hardware the following week. I also bought a water depth gauge so I could get the last measurements I needed, the height for the posts at the end, which would go down into the lake. If it was more than 15 feet or so, I would probably just get some anchors and let it float. But the original plans called for posts, so I figured I would stick to it if I could. The next weekend, I was back out at the house. I borrowed a friend's pickup to haul most everything out in one trip. I also brought some food, water, and other essentials. It would make building a lot easier if I just stayed out at the house for a few days without having to drive back and forth to town. Enough of my grandpa's furniture was still there to make shorter stays comfortable enough. The first thing I did was go out to get the depth measurements I needed. I dragged the old rowboat to the overgrown grassy shore of the lake, praying the whole time that it would stay afloat at least long enough for me to get the reading. The meter I got seemed simple enough. It looked like a flashlight. You're supposed to stick it in at the surface of the water and it uses a laser to tell how far it is to the bottom. The wonders of modern technology. Lucky for me, the boat still floated and didn't even seem to have any major leaks. I hopped aboard and paddled out about 30 feet to where the end of the dock would be. I uncapped the depth meter, stuck it in, flipped a switch, and... nothing. The display on the side just kept flashing, reading, for what seemed like an unusual length of time. After a minute or so, the message changed to error, and it turned back off. I tried a few more times, but the result was the same. The wonders of modern technology. And so I headed back to the hardware store. Luckily, there was a smaller one closer to the house, so I didn't have to go all the way back into town. I bought another water depth meter. This one was more old school, just a weight on the end of a line that you could spool out. Once it hit the bottom, you could just read the numbers on the line. Basically just a tape measure with a hunk of metal at the end. Probably what I should have gotten in the first place. I got back to the house and rode out onto the lake once more. I tossed the weight into the water and let it start to sink. But it didn't stop. The line kept going, unspooling more and more, almost seeming to pick up speed. Fifteen feet... 30 feet? 50 feet? I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It eventually stopped at 100 feet, not because it had hit anything, but because that was as far as my meter line went. That couldn't possibly be right. Sure, I'd never touched the bottom as a kid, but couldn't be that deep, could it? I spent a few minutes reeling it back in and tried again, thinking somehow it would be different. But sure enough, it only stopped when there was no line left to give it. I just stood there, scratching my head for a bit, unsure on where to even go from here. 
Should I get a longer line? Even if I did hit the bottom, it wasn't like I could use posts for the dock now. As I thought on it, the depth meter slipped from my hands and fell off the side of the boat. It immediately disappeared from the surface, dragged down by the weight on the other end. Well, there goes a waste of thirty dollars, I thought to myself. I sat back on the boat for a while, doing some quick searches on my phone. After fifteen minutes or so, the boat suddenly lurched. I steadied myself, almost losing my lone paddle over the side as well. It felt like the world's shortest earthquake, and I could see ripples hitting the shores on all sides. Before I could even guess at what it was, a loud splash erupted beside me and showered me in murky lake water. Something flew out from the water, straight up in the air so fast I barely saw it. I shielded my head as it fell back down, landing hard with a resounding thunk between my legs. I cracked one eye open after a few moments. I thought the boat was still moving, but I quickly realized it was just my own trembling. There in the bottom of the boat was the metal weight from the end of my depth meter, still attached to a few feet of line. The line looked like it had been torn off, and what was left was frayed and mangled. I rode back to the shore faster than I'd ever rode before. As I did, I could have sworn the surface of the lake started to swirl and pull back from the edges. I paddled harder. As I reached the grass, I crawled from the boat and took a few minutes to catch my breath. Looking back from the safety of firm ground, all I saw was a once again calm lake, the sun starting to set in the distance and glinting off the glass-like surface. I was bewildered and shaken up in equal measure. What the hell was that? I went inside and dried off the best I could. I changed into my pajamas and sat by the back door, staring out at the lake. Part of me just wanted to hop in the truck and leave, but I couldn't. All I could do was watch the surface, waiting for something else to happen. Every time a dragonfly would land on the lake, or a toad would hop out, I nearly jumped out of my skin. The reasonable thoughts of doubt started to creep into my mind. Maybe I had just imagined it. Maybe there was a very rational and mundane explanation for all of this. Every time these thoughts came back, I looked at the remains of the depth line on the kitchen counter, and then I looked back out to the lake. After a few hours, I felt my eyelids start to grow heavy. I fought valiantly, but I soon lost the battle to my weariness. I had vivid dreams. The kind that you can't remember, not that you'd want to. The kind that leaves you in a cold sweat in the middle of the night. Sure enough, I woke in a gasp, nearly falling out of the dining room chair I had commandeered for my lookout. As I steadied my breathing and regained my senses, I looked back to the lake almost immediately. Nothing. Just the moonlight on a calm little patch of water. Once again, I started to question what had happened earlier. Maybe it had just been some large deep water crocodile or something. Were those a thing? I looked back at the broken depth meter again, as if it held some sort of secrets that would answer everything for me. It didn't. But as I looked it over once more, the light from outside grew brighter. It was subtle at first, like the moon moving out from behind a cloud. But it kept growing brighter still. As I looked back outside, I saw its source. The lake had begun to glow with an ethereal blue-green light. Ripples had appeared on its surface, starting in the center and moving outward. At first, they only came every minute or so, but they got faster as the lake grew brighter. In my ears, I started to hear a low hum and an uncomfortable pressure, like descending in an airplane. I tried to run, 
to grab the car keys and leave, but my legs refused to budge. The lake began to rise unnaturally, like some sort of huge bubble was pushing its way upward, creating a dome of swirling water and pulsing light. It rose up and up until it was taller than the house and all the trees surrounding it. Finally, I felt myself stand up, but my brief sense of relief turned to horror as I felt my legs walking of their own accord towards the back door, towards the lake. Soon I felt grass under my bare feet and a spray of cool mist covered my skin. I couldn't stop myself. I couldn't even blink. The dome of water had stopped growing. The light started flashing irregularly, like the lake held inside it a violent thunderstorm. In the flashes, I started to make out some sort of solid shape. It was massive, easily 50 feet across. It seemed to be curled in on itself, like a seashell or a hurricane, but the edges were spotted with tendrils here and there that twitched and flicked like a cat's tail. In the center, the light was strongest, and it seemed to shine down on me like a spotlight. I screamed, or at least it felt like I did. I kept walking forward at a steady pace until I was only a few feet from the wall of water. One of the tendrils stretched out and waited just underneath the surface, beckoning me to come forward. A voice in my head spoke louder than my own thoughts. Come in, it said, the words leaking through the folds of my brain. He's already here. I've seen you in his memories. I kept walking. I held out my hand. I embraced the inevitable. The next thing I knew, I was sitting in a house I didn't recognize. One of the neighbor's places, I soon learned. He told me how he'd found me, wandering in the woods in my pajamas, soaking wet. He said it gave him deja vu from when he had found my grandpa years ago. My mom showed up to get me an hour or so later. I couldn't read much from her face, and we didn't say anything on the drive back to her house. The next few weeks were full of scans and tests, doctors and specialists. I usually zone out when they go over the results, but the gist is always the same. Nothing wrong. Have to run some more tests. It almost makes me laugh, but I know my mom doesn't see any humor in it. I've been getting worse all the while. It's hard for me to think straight, and sometimes I feel like I'm dreaming even when I'm awake. I've been forgetting things. Just little things here and there, but they're starting to add up. Even my favorite memories of my grandpa are starting to feel blurry and faded. I can still feel the remnants of joy when I focus, but the details are getting harder and harder to grasp. So I decided to write this all down here before it too starts to fade away. I don't know what was out in that lake. My mom said she's selling the place and she makes sure I don't leave the house without her. At least, not until I'm all better, she says. But somehow, some way, I just know. In the end, I'll be back at the lake. Ah, yes. The call of water. The draw of a dark and deep lake. Reading a good story about a horror that lies in the depths of a lake or the ocean feels like coming home, doesn't it? I think it calls to our primal fear of the unknown. More to the point, our fear of getting too close to the unknown. I think I've mentioned this before, but have you ever been floating over a large body of water, and when you look down and can't see the bottom, 
you suddenly become acutely aware of how much space is beneath you and how little of it you can see. Setting aside the fear of sinking all the way down, which is potent enough, you also might wonder what or who could be just beneath you, out of sight, awakened by your movements in the water. If you enjoyed this story, please check out the author in the links below. Please also leave a like on this video and subscribe for more stories like this one. Whatever you do, keep a firm grip on your tools and don't fall asleep. <laughs>